Hi, so today I would like to talk about uh, the work I've been doing developing a new approach to uh, calculate absorption spectra, uh, focusing mainly on how we can develop an approach to actually start studying uh, larger systems such as the photoactive yellow protein. Uh, so photoactive yellow protein is a photosensor for blue light in certain bacteria, and actually when it absorbs light, um, it undergoes an isomerization to a first intermediate uh, form, and then after that it uh, undergoes protonation and forms a second intermediate structure, and then over time it, it actually restores itself back to um, the PYP protein uh, that I'm showing a crystal structure uh, representation of here. And this is a nice uh, system to study photosensors uh, because it's a relatively small protein, only 125 residues. And experimentally, it's nice to work with because it's actually water soluble. And so this is a nice system to uh, work with to see if we can develop a, a different uh, approach to develop uh, accurate uh, um, absorption spectra calculations. Um, but in order to do this, uh, we run into a common problem uh, where there is some computational cost associated with the type of method or approach you'd like to use uh, and uh, different um, uh, methods such as density functional theory or, or atomistic molecular models has a different formal cost which allows you to either study different uh, time scales or in this case look at different system sizes. And so with the absorption of light, that's an inherently quantum mechanical property. And so that really leaves us with uh, looking at density functional theory or correlated methods uh, such as MP2 or coupled cluster theory. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, with these correlated methods, they scale as something like system size to the sixth or system size to the fifth. So one approach that I've been uh, working with is to develop uh, an approximation that actually lowers the uh, formal cost of some of these correlated methods uh, to uh, a system size to the fourth, so that it's actually uh, acting more like the cost of a density functional theory calculation while maintaining some of the nice properties, uh, specifically of coupled cluster theory. And I'll be looking at uh, CC2, which is uh, a coupled cluster theory that includes some of the singles and doubles approximations. Furthermore, uh, we can uh, accelerate these types of methods using novel architectures such as graphics cards. And so I want to spend a little time uh, talking about uh, graphics cards and why uh, they're of use here. So GPUs are these highly parallel many core processors uh, that have a hierarchy of threads that execute in parallel. And if you have a, a problem or an algorithm that can uh, execute the same program on many data elements in parallel, then you're going to get a nice um, uh, speed up using a graphics card because the, the GPU is really um, meant to do the same program uh, on, on multiple threads. And so this is actually from NVIDIA and it's comparing uh, the different types of graphics cards over the years uh, in single precision and double precision and relative to uh, some of the different CPUs available at the same time. Um, so if you can uh, work with a problem where you are executing the same program on many threads in parallel, then you're going to get a nice uh, uh, speed up. However, uh, there are some challenges with that, uh, working out load balancing uh, and making sure you can formulate your algorithm at this uh, more fine-grained parallelism level. And then also with the graphics card, uh, you actually run, can run into some memory limitations uh, because the CPU has uh, many uh, um, large amounts of memory available depending on uh, what type of CPU you want to use, but often the graphics cards, uh, you have a very small amount of memory and you either have to work with transferring memory onto the card and, and back to the CPU or you have to reformulate your program, or your pro program in a way that can break up uh, your, your data to actually uh, fit in the memory of a GPU. And so one of the, the ways I've been uh, looking at different uh, couple cluster methods is actually through an approximation we've been developing called tensor hypercontraction. 
And in a lot of quantum uh, chemistry codes, you deal with something called the electron repulsion integrals. And you can think of this as the interaction of some electron density with some other electron density over uh, some distance r12. And what this really is, is actually a fourth order tensor. And so you can think of uh, this as a way to break up a tensor and try and work with these electron repulsion integrals in a way that is more manageable or may offer more uh, flexibility for developing different algorithms. And so what, what we've developed is tensor hy hypercontraction, which has this representation, uh, where we have these uh, matrices uh, that we call X uh, and Z. And here Z acts like an effective 1 over R12 operator, like you would see in the, the formal representation. And there are, there are different ways to form these, and I'll go over that in a little bit. Um, but if you think of it as just looking at some tensor representation, if you have some third order tensor, uh, you can think of just breaking it up into these different components uh, to work with. And this has actually allowed us to reduce the formal scaling of CC2 from n to the fifth uh, down to n to the fourth. And so if we look a little more closely at th this representation, uh, here I'm using P and Q to, denote, to denote actually a grid point index. Uh, and there are different ways to form these, but <coughs> the way I'm looking at is to actually just form these different X matrices on some molecular grid. And then we uh, do a least squares uh, regression type fitting to determine our Z factor. So here I have, um, a representation of butadiene, where this is just some, some small molecule, and then these little dots here represent uh, the grid that we would use uh, with this molecule. And so this allows us to work with many different matrices to uh, really explore different types of algorithms that would overall lead to the same result, um, but offer many different uh, choices for in intermediates along the way. And so one, one way that that benefits us is now that we actually have this uh, algebraic representation and a grid uh, to work with, we can actually write our algorithm to sort of uh, drag one of these grid point indices uh, as long as we can, and then we can actually block over uh, the grid that we're working with. So if we wanted to, say, work with two graphics cards, we might think of breaking this up into some region with this set of grid points and using uh, that set of grid points for as long as we can on one GPU and then at the same time uh, looking at calculating our intermediates of this set of grid points uh, in parallel. And then at some point we do need to bring this information back together, uh, but depending on what system you're looking at or um, the number of nodes you would like to use. It really allows you to break this up uh, into many different um, sets of grid points, do a lot of independent work before having to bring it all back together to calculate your either excited states or the ground state information. So what does this look like? Well, uh, we have been working on uh, developing this approach for uh, the past year, and I've gone through a number of different ways to uh, use graphics cards to do a couple cluster calculation with this approximation. And what I've uh, actually determined is that we can do this in many different uh, parts with minimal MPI communication um, between uh, these different pieces. And then each of these parts has uh, many different, actually, linear algebra calls, as well as specialized CUDA calls. So that also allows us to take advantage of some of the uh, libraries that are out there that have been developed for graphic cards specifically. But working with GPUs, uh, it turns out that there is sort of a balancing problem. And if you look at the number 
uh, if you look at increasing your uh, system size, obviously you're going to uh, increase the amount of time it takes per uh, excited state iteration. But also if we look at how we're uh, blocking over grid points, as we decrease our grid point block size, we actually end up um, being fairly even uh, in terms of the amount of time it takes uh, until we reach this point where uh, the amount of time it takes to do an iteration increases dramatically. And so what we find is that when we're reaching this point, we're not actually fully utilizing the graphics card. And so what's really happening is that we have a lot of uh, work that's available to do on the GPU, but many of these threads are idle. And so uh, the, the actual amount of time it takes uh, increases because you're not using the card as efficiently as you could. But on the other end, if you do uh, use too large of a grid point uh, block size, you run into the problem that you're going to run out of the available memory on a graphics card. And so there's this, this balancing problem uh, finding the appropriate grid point size for your, your system. And what that really means for Blue Waters is uh, also determining the appropriate number of, you of nodes you want to use to uh, do your calculations. And so now I'd like to go back to uh, the photoactive yellow protein. Um, here I'm showing just the chromophore of the protein, and I'm comparing it to uh, the um, method RIEOM, or RIEOMCC2, which is our uh, sort of benchmark for uh, just what, what the difference is when we include this tensor hypercontraction approximation relative to the, the sort of standard way of doing that calculation, which does scale as n to the fifth. And so for um, this, this absorption spectra, I'm looking at 500 different geometries and the excited states calculated for those geometries. And we see that we do get nice agreement with the typical way of, of doing, this approx or doing this type of uh, approach for excited states. Uh, but we'd really like to get a better understanding of what the uh, PYP system uh, looks like with this approach. And so here I've done some QMMM calculations on just, once again, a smaller uh, quantum chemistry region. Um, but in red, I'm showing the results we get with tensor hypercontracted EUMCC2, and I'm comparing that to the experiment here. And uh, I have applied a small shift just to align the maximum absorption, but that shift is only um, 0.04 EV. And if you look at uh, what you would be getting with uh, TDDFT calculations for the same set of geometries, um, the TDDFT lambda max is actually around uh, 3.5. So this is encouraging that we're getting uh, more accurate results. Um, but if you notice, uh, we're not quite capturing uh, the sh correct shape for the absorption spectra. And so I'm working on looking at larger QM regions, um, doing different molecular dynamics sampling to uh, see if there's uh, something with our geometry sampling that might be giving a rise to this shape. Uh, and then I'm also starting to look at uh, what happens when we uh, look at PYP in a solvated environment and if that uh, affects how we're, um, uh, the shape that we are getting with the THC EOM CC2 calculation. Um, so with that, I would like to thank my advisor, Todd Martinez. Um, the number of people who have uh, been working on tensor hypercontraction in general, uh, and my point of contact, Victor Anisimov, uh, for, his, for his help with getting things up and running on Blue Waters, uh, as well as Christine Isborn, who did some of the initial PYP molecular dynamics runs. And I'd like to thank the NCSA staff and also Blue Waters and NS NSF for uh, supporting me through the Blue Waters Fellowship this year. Uh, so with that, if there's any questions, 
Uh, so the, the cost of the step of forming X and Z, or overall? Uh, so that step does scale as n to the fourth, uh, the way we are doing it currently. Um, and so actually that has actually become uh, a limiting step in this uh, approach. So when I go to over four GPUs, uh, this step has actually become the, the rate limiting step. And so there is someone who is working on porting that to the graphics card as well. There's a number of um, grid zones. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you're f so if you're familiar with like the density fitting uh, basis sets, uh, the number of grid points actually ends up being roughly three times the size of that that basis set for any given molecule. Uh, so it's uh, related to um, just the number of auxiliary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Yeah. Uh, so both of these are showing a two-peak structure. Uh, there is a slight difference in the intensity, um, and they've been scaled just to meet the same maximum absorption uh, peak for comparison. And then there is uh, a slight shoulder here, which is more accentuated by the red curve, uh, but there is that fine uh, shoulder that we get with tensor hypercontracted EOMCC2, as well as this small shoulder here. Uh, so we, we can look at the excited states, um, and these are from, from different states. Uh, these are, are uh, s states that have a low uh, oscillator strength, uh, and so they, they don't have a very uh, dominant peak, but they do show up uh, in the shoulder. It is getting it. It's just um, I'm using in, uh, a different way to calculate. I'm I'm using a different way to calculate the oscillator strength, so it's not getting the same intensity as uh, the benchmark calculation. Um, but it is still picking up that excited state. Uh, no, that's just the approximation that I'm using for the oscillator strength, which is slightly different from the approach that may be used in this other code. Um, it normally you would want to f solve for the full left hand and right hand eigenvalue solutions. Here I'm only showing uh, a calculation with the right hand eigenvalue solutions. Uh, 